Joining the podcast today is Travis Fisher. He is the Director of Energy and Environmental Policy at the Cato Institute, and that's my colleague. He has nearly 20 years of experience in energy policy, including leadership roles at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Institute for Energy Research, Department of Energy, Electricity, Consumers Resource Council, and the Heritage Foundation. And he joins the podcast today to discuss the way toward greater energy abundance and the threats and obstacles to progress toward that goal. How are you, Travis? Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great. So uh, let's start with some of the obstacles and threats to progress, of which I understand there are many in the energy policy realm. What should be on our listeners' radar? Yeah, well, in the past few years, it's become a target-rich environment. Um, Particularly, I would focus on the regulatory regime. So the Environmental Protection Agency is doing a lot of stuff that is basically restricting, you know, the way we can generate power, the way we can use it, all sorts of things. Same with the Department of Energy in terms of things like they call them appliance efficiency standards for, for appliances and things like that. But really, what they can do through... The regulatory process it turns into a de facto ban on all of this stuff so we can't really build the power plants that we would like to be able to build and use we can't buy the appliances we want to buy uh so th- there are just uh it's it's an incredible i always call it a target rich environment that there's there's so much going on right now and you know i'm i'm trying to do my part i'm trying to be engaged in the uh you know th- there's usually a comment period on a new you know regulatory proposal. So I try to get involved in those, but uh, it feels right right now like a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, it really is. There's so much going on. And one of the things uh, that has happened recently, I know, is that the Inflation Reduction Act has quite a lot in it that impacts energy policy. Could you talk about some of that? Yeah. So it's kind of, they're getting you coming and going. There's the, there's the subsidy paradigm, there's the regulatory paradigm, and they actually work together against us. Um, The IRA, I mean, yeah, I always hesitate to call it the Inflation Reduction Act because we're going to do so much spending that I think it's going to actually increase inflation. But um, the main, so the thrust of it was the, you know, the climate side, which is all subsidies. This is just a massive amount of subsidies for, you know, what what the Biden team would call clean energy, things like wind, solar. I think the vast majority is actually going to go to solar. And it's uh, in the form of a production tax credit. So you generate the electricity, you get a tax credit. The problem that I see, because that sounds kind of nice. The problem that I see is, you know, the amount of the subsidy is something that rivals the wholesale market price of the energy. So my concern is that people aren't going to be worried about generating electricity for the purpose of, you know, doing well in the market. They want to do well by subsidies. Um, so it's not only a huge distraction, but it's a huge, um, it's a market distortion. It's going to cost taxpayers a ridiculous amount of money, something like $100 billion a year. And that plays out year after year after year. I actually think the subsidy train won't stop until well beyond 2050. Um, uh, I mean, I think we should stop it before that, but I don't think it will stop on its own. Um, so this just a an incredible amount of spending. Uh, and you, you can imagine all the damage that's going to do. It's going to have sort of second order effects where let's say you want to generate a lot of wind energy where there's no people. Um, you can still collect the production tax credit that way, but you need to connect to the grid and there isn't ample transmission to be able to do that. So they're also going to come back and ask for more transmission. Uh, that's where it gets really dicey, where it's not just the EPA or the DOE or subsidies or all that. Then you start getting into things like, you know, the the FERC angle and all, all of that stuff where they, you know, who's going to who's going to build the transmission? Who's going to pay for it? All of these questions are enormous. And we sort of uh, skip past them just saying, well, we're doing it for the climate. So don't ask questions. All right. And you uh, you mentioned in an earlier exchange we had before I started recording uh, this podcast, an interesting stat about how much people would be willing to pay with regards to um, actions to help protect the environment. Could you 
Uh, talk more about that. That was really interesting to me. Yeah. So the the subsidy regime on its own is going to be something mm-hmm. like uh, upwards of $1,000 per household in terms of the cost of it. Um, that is, I mean, it breaks down in terms of the, the population, it breaks down to something like uh, $300 a year per person. We know not everybody's a taxpayer and you know that's not how households work. But um, the willingness to pay thing is sort of the what you would expect to be the benefit side of it. So we know the cost pretty well. We can we can at least do some math and figure out what we think the cost will be. The benefit would be what people are hoping to get from the policy in terms of climate impacts and things like that. Um, one way to to try to address that is there's a lot of polling about sort of what would you be willing to pay? If your monthly costs go up by X dollars, would you support that policy if it meant that it was going to address climate change? And the most interesting thing that I've seen, because I've been I've been tracking this for a few years, it's usually you lose about half the people as soon as you start asking them to fork up any cash at all, um, which I guess kind of makes sense. The most recent one, though, and I believe this is 2023, that number fell well below half, you know, in terms of people who would support it, even a one dollar per month. This is like a pretty low threshold, right? It's like, are you willing to pay one dollar extra per month to address climate change? The answer used to be something in the 50 percent ish, 60 percent that fell to the 30s. Like, let's see, it was the 38 uh, percent in the last poll. So you can see the difference between or the staggering costs of the policies versus what people are willing to pay for a climate policy in the abstract. So I, you know, that that mismatch is often not reported. Um, and I think it's a glaring omission, sort of a, you know, even if folks say, because it's it's interesting when you ask people, should we address climate change? Typically, the answer is absolutely. Why not? Then you go to that next level of, OK, but how much are you how much of your own money are you willing to put towards the effort? And it's something like, you know, if you're pretty well off, you know, it's like, I don't know, five bucks a month. It's it's not on the order of thousands of dollars per year, which is exactly what we're doing now. So it's out of line with taxpayer preferences. And it's not even just the subsidies for mostly solar power. You said there's a lot in there. I know there, there's something about electric vehicles. Can you talk more about what's in the IRA with regards to energy and environmental policy? So I'm doing a policy analysis now that goes through the details, but uh, the short version is it hits almost everything. And they've done, I, I give them credit in terms of the uh, you know the public choice theory of this, where if you spread the subsidies to almost every region, almost every state, almost every congressional district, then it becomes harder to remove. It becomes harder to repeal. So they've done a very clever job of making sure the subsidies spread almost everywhere. So almost every industry, almost every state and region. So it's everything from you know, the manufacturing side of EVs and batteries and things like that, the point of sale. So there's a $7,500 tax credit if you buy an EV, um, all sorts of things like that. The the thing that I focused on the most, because I think it's the biggest cost category, is that production tax credit for non-emitting electricity production. So that applies across the board. That, that applies to, you know, I, I think the bulk will go to solar, but also wind. There's a provision for existing nuclear I think a higher amount would go to new nuclear, um, geothermal, all of that stuff. So it's kind of a kind of a grab bag in terms of the uh, like how the subsidies apply. It's a whole bunch of stuff. Probably the most lucrative relative to the market value is the subsidy for hydrogen. So if you make green hydrogen, which um, I don't, I'm not an expert on the colors. Of, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the hydrogen rainbow. But green hydrogen is when you do electrolysis through uh so you have a renewable energy source doing the electrolysis of water splitting it from h2o to hydrogen and oxygen but uh i think it would also be green if you if you started with methane as the feedstock and separated out the hydrogen but somehow captured the carbon uh, i think that also qualifies as green i'm not sure but it, anyways the subsidy for green hydrogen is is well above market value and part of the reason i bring that up is because it you begin to see how all these things tie together. So um, a lot of what is in the IRA is actually a foundation for what the EPA is doing. So EPA couldn't have done its power plant rule and said, well, green hydrogen is a, you know, the, the, the legal term, it's supposed to be adequately demonstrated. 
Um, it's supposed to be a technology. You're supposed to choose the best technology and it's supposed to be adequately demonstrated. Um, green hydrogen is not, it's just flatly not. But the case that EPA made was, well, the IRA throws so much subsidy at it that we can say it's adequately demonstrated because it's adequately subsidized. And that's the kind of thing where I'm like, I'm not sure people are aware of all the, the ways that sort of the subsidy elements tie into the regulatory side of things. Um, and it's not a pleasant side. I mean, once you start cracking into the stuff, it looks pretty ugly pretty fast. Um, but as you said, in terms of the willingness to pay, I think people should be aware of this and vote accordingly because um, it's really not, I, I don't think it's a popular policy once you once you dig into the details. All right. It seems like it costs more than most people uh, would prefer to pay. And also it's not clear that some of these things do address the environmental challenges that they are meant to. Like you said, this could subsidize power production in places where there is not really the demand. It could subsidize forms of power that do not produce enough energy to be worth that much investment. And it's interesting that you said that this actually includes nuclear because until recently, many environmentalists and, and people who care about the environment actually opposed nuclear power. And so that would have been excluded entirely. Is that correct? Yeah, and it had been in the past. I think there was a production tax credit for new nuclear that I think the Vogel plant was trying to capture, but I'm not sure there was the same amount of new builds in nuclear that we were expecting when, when that tax credit passed. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I guess that's a positive spin. Um, the fact that it's resource neutral or that it will be. So this is starting in beginning of 2025 is when the tech neutral PTC kicks in. But um, the fact that it applies across the board, I think, is a benefit relative to the stuff we've been doing in the past. You know, a, a very common state policy is the renewable portfolio standard. So uh, a state would basically say, I want this percent of wind or solar or hydro or nukes or whatever, and they would just mandate it. Um, so at least there's an open-ended quality to this, but uh, it's just a staggering amount of money. And of course, there are, in addition to the subsidies, a bunch of other, as you said, provisions in the IRA that affect this policy area. Um, I have heard something about electric cars, a standardization of charging stations that's basically need to favor some electric car manufacturers and not others. Um, what What is going on with the policy push toward electric cars right now? So that's another example where the subsidy side sort of has a, I would call it a belts and suspenders approach. You subsidize mm -hmm. it, but you also mandate it. Um, right. So the EPA has a, they're calling it a, uh, you know, it's a, it, it's an emission standard. But the only way that a car manufacturer can meet the standard is by selling a majority of EVs. So that would kick in. It's a proposed rule at this stage. But if it goes final, as it was proposed, that would make the majority of new car sales EVs by as early as you know 2032. So we're, we're talking very short order turnover. Um, but that also was, in part, the EPA was able to do that because of the EV subsidies. And the claim is that, well, with all these incentives, people are going to do this anyways. So our our new um, you know emissions guidelines are are not going to move the needle that much. We're, we're basically just following where the needle is going to go anyways. Um, so, but the only reason they're able to make that claim is because of the the very large subsidies. Ironically, though, there, there's a uh, you know I I there's there's a theme that I've noticed that I w wanted to touch on. It seems like bad ideas love to collide. They sort of come in in groups. So in, in this case, it's like we're going to mandate EVs. But then when you think about what goes into an electric vehicle, it's a lot of batteries. I mean, there's no two ways about it. I don't know if you, you've ever seen sort of the, the bottom of a Tesla. It looks like somebody took like a bunch of, you know, D-sized batteries and just put them all together. And that's like the bed of the car. That's like the bottom of it. It's just a ridiculous amount of material. And the question is, where are we going to get that stuff? We We don't have... The ability to mine in the U.S. Um, the permitting process is is you know too onerous, and in fact, um, there are mines that you know we're supposed to get copper, things like that, things that you need for EVs. Um, but at the same time, the same admin is saying no, we're we're, we're not going to open any mines. So it's 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 almost like they they don't really connect the dots between the thing that they're 
mandating and sort of the, the way to get there. All right, so there's the question of environmental impact, whether they're even buildable, and also consumer preferences, if this is really what people want. And there, there seems to be a pattern where there are a bunch of regulatory rules in this area that go against consumer preferences. Well, we hear a lot about things like washing machines and dishwashers that are just not as good uh, because they are not allowed to be. Can you talk a little bit about that? What's going on with appliances? Yeah. I wish we could zoom out a bit and talk about economic efficiency, which include all sorts of things that we like, yeah. as opposed to just energy efficiency, which is the, that's the dogged focus of the, the, the DOE the energy efficiency program is like, well, we need to always use less energy, less water, all of that stuff. Um, what that does though, in practice is it gives you a less effective appliance. Like personally, I don't really care how much energy my appliance uses if it's doing the job really well and really fast. Um, you know, there's there's some threshold where I'll start saying like, oh wow, I can't believe you use that much energy. I don't I don't think that's what people are focused on these days. Now it's more like, well, I ran the dishwasher and it didn't really clean the stuff, and it ran for two hours, and by the time it was done, it still didn't really do the job that I wanted it to do. Um, so I wish we would get back to this idea that we need to just use appliances for what they're supposed to be used for instead of treating them as a thing to be minimized, which is kind of the, the way it's been. Um, I mean, in DOE's defense, that's in statute. Um, so they're kind of held to the standard. They're made to do it. Um, but I think we should just change the statute. All right. That's concerning their hands are tied there because if also people are running their dishwasher multiple times then to get the same you know, clean that they would have before, it's not clear that actually even saves energy. Um, but well, and the, 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 there's also this really interesting, if if you search online, you can find these hacks of like ways to remove the thing that like, let's say it's a shower head and they wanted to use less water. Like, why is the DOE regulating my shower head? Worth asking, right? What well, does? Uh, and it's up to the DOE. This is where they do have some discretion in terms of choosing things to add to the list. I think shower heads were added later, but mm -hmm. the idea is like, well, you can take out the component. There's like a piece that, that basically makes it a lower flow shower head, or you can like go in there, tinker with it, take it out. Um, so all of these hacks are, are starting to come up. Like, I think people are sort of starting to outsmart the, the regs. Um, because I mean, I think that's, that shows in a fundamental way that people don't actually want the products that are being mandated. And that's the same with shower heads that don't really work or, you know, all, all the appliances in the kitchen, all, all of that stuff. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of crazy that we ended up here, but I, I'm hopeful that we can address the underlying statute because even if it made sense back in the 70s, and I'm not sure it ever did, um, I think times are very different now. And that's, of course, just one example of something the DOE is doing, you are much more plugged into this. What else should people be aware of that's going on from the DOE? Um, I mean, there are a handful of programs. One, one thing that I think is a little underhanded that I'd like to flag for folks is that there is some money in the Inflation Reduction Act that's basically, it's federal money that goes down and in some cases it goes through a DOE grant where it's basically bribing states to come up with a new you know, climate program. And then it's really tricky because if the state rejects the money, which they can, then it's actually up to uh, like local government can step up and claim that money that was re rejected by the state. So we've seen that in Florida, for example. So it's this weird thing where um, it was a, you know, the, the IRA was passed under a budget reconciliation process. But it really did establish new policy in a lot of ways, um, and that included in terms of there's now a federal bribe to set up a climate program at your at the state level, and if you don't do that, then of course the cities can step up and claim that cash. There's just a lot of cash on the table, and I know that sounds intriguing to a lot of people. But that's your cash, uh, so it's just it, it's I I see it as an abusive process, but. Um, it's not really getting a lot of coverage and I wish it would because I, um, which is part of the reason I'm doing the, the, the paper about the, the IRA, there's so much in it and it can be overwhelming pretty fast. I mean, the, 
the statute itself was something like 270 pages. Um, and the energy portion of that is about a third of it. So um, wow. it's just a lot of very dense language and folks are still like, here, here's, here's an example too. The, there's the statute part of it, which is already confusing. And then there's the stuff that the IRS has to work out later. So there's all sorts of like implementation guidelines on how exactly do you qualify for this subsidy versus that? What's the threshold? Uh, so understanding and following the IRS guidance is another, it's like a full-time job for a lot of people. Um, so it's just a very complicated, uh, I think intentionally complex process that uh, it's kind of like, well, let's just get the money out the door before anybody realizes what's going on. And then it's going to be really, really hard to repeal because, you know, let's say you're, you're a politician and you have, an IRA supported factory that just opened up, it's going to be really hard to turn around and say, actually, I'm going to vote against this thing that just got the factory built. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's genius on the one hand. I think it's like an evil genius type approach, but I mean, for right now, at least it's working. Uh, I'm going to hope to get it repealed. Cause I, I, I think the policies in, in the IRA are just awful. Uh, but I, you know, step one is to raise a, awareness of all these issues. And that's what you're doing. Are there any particularly egregious uh, cases that you'd like to bring to people's attention, maybe of money being spread by this act to something that is very clearly not going to have an environmental benefit? It's just a giveaway uh, that's ineffective and expensive to taxpayers. One thing that was that really stood out to me was uh, a lot of the money is going to the DOE's loan programs office, mm -hmm. and people will know that name. That was the office that gave the loan to Solyndra, wow. which was sort of this epic failure. I think it was only on the order of like $500 million, which is weird to say in hindsight, that was only half a billion dollars. Um, and I think the loan programs office already had, you know, dozens of billions of dollars to play with. And the IRA just put that all on steroids. I think it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars now. And there was some testimony from the inspector general from the DOE and this was before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And I believe it was after I started at Cato. So after August, somewhere in the fall of last year, the testimony from her was stark and it was alarming to me. She was basically saying there's so much money moving around that I, as the inspector general, have no chance of catching fraud. And wow. she's at the panel with the director of the loan programs office right next to her. And they're basically asking him, hey, uh, this is a ridiculous amount of money. And aren't there some sort of uh, foul play processes going on with how you would access that money? And he's sort of turned into this like uh, puppet master type guy where he's just moving around massive amounts, amounts of money. Um, that's the one thing that I'm like, even if you wanted to do, even if you wanted to spend this amount of money, even if you're in that, you know, small minority that says a dollar a month, that's nothing. I'll, you know. $100 a month, I'm willing to pay a bunch to address the climate issue. Even if you're in that camp, wouldn't you want the money to be spent on what it was supposed to be spent on in like a not fraudulent way? Um, but that to, to have the inspector general testify before the Senate and say, there's no way I'm going to catch all the fraud that's about to happen. That that took me aback. That, that was the kind of thing where I was like, this is, this is too much money. This is too fast. We have no control over it. Uh, the fraud and abuse is going to be rampant. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you hate to be right about. But I think a year from now, we're going to look back and say, there was a lot of stuff going on that we just had no way of, of catching. Are there any mechanisms for accountability? What are the standards by which you know these, these programs getting money through this act are being judged? Is there some uh, you know amount of CO2 that something has to is there some amounts per dollar that we're getting allegedly out of this or are there no standards? Well, it depends on the program. And actually the, the track record of the loan programs office um, to give them credit, they, they would say they're actually doing pretty well that they've okay. on, on net, they've maybe made money for the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. um, and that raises all sorts of interesting questions about like, aren't you there? Don't you exist to give very uh, high risk loans and shouldn't you be on net losing money you shouldn't be a marketplace um but i mean they, they do have the standards of due diligence and I, I i worked with the staff there when i was at the doe um very well-meaning very smart people i just think at the end of the day there's going to be even if they try their best there's just so much 
money and it's not really their money. Um, this sort of applies across the board. So if you're spending other people's money, it's just not the same. Even if you try your best, it's not the same. Fair enough. And we've been talking mostly about the IRA and the DOE. What about the EPA? What sort of regulatory things are going on there that we should be aware of? So uh, the way I would characterize it, they're off the rails. I mean, I've long disagreed with their policies and I didn't like the way that they approached, you know, the clean power plan from this goes back to like 2015. This was the idea that you can use the Clean Air Act. You can use statutes that have been around for 30 or 40 years and sort of reimagine them. Um, and that's ultimately what got the Supreme Court to name the major questions doctrine. It was the EPA's overreach that that got them in that hot water. And, you know, that, that was eventually uh, it was the clean power plan that was checked by the courts and said, you have to go back to the drawing board. This is not the way to do it. And it was this idea that you can reimagine the the whole power grid as a system. So then EPA is like, well, I know the best system for emissions reduction. It's basically you just shift things around. And then it's then it's this central planning exercise at the EPA based on no congressional authority. That was the other thing was the, I mean, if it's a major question, it needs to be decided by Congress. It needs to be decided by elected representatives of the people. Uh, EPA basically took that court case and said, it was like a hold my beer moment. They were just like, we're just going to do it again. It's going to be even worse. So they, but it was on sort of the coattails of the IRA money. They were able to say, well, now we've changed our minds. The new best system is either carbon capture, which is not adequately demonstrated, or green hydrogen, also not adequately demonstrated. So they just went back and said, we're going to, instead of saying, um, we hear you, Supreme Court. We need clear authority to do whatever we're going to do. They just said, we'll just take another shot. So interesting thing here, and the reason I think there's, you know, I'm hesitant to say foul play because I don't want to, who knows what people are thinking. Uh, I, don't, I can't judge anyone's intentions. But the structure of the proposal, the proposed, the new power plant rule was that it would take effect immediately upon the date of the proposal. So there are a lot of people. So if I were trying to build a gas fired power plant right now, I don't know what rules I'm going to be facing. Is it going to be the proposal? Is it going to be what's in the final rule? The final rule hasn't come out yet. Um, but you've basically been put on notice that if you're going to build a, a gas fired power plant after, you know, the, the, the published date for the proposal was in May of 2023. If you're going to build a power plant after that, uh, who knows what kind of rules you're going to face. But here's the tricky part. I think, it's my hunch, that that uncertainty is something like, um, you know, instead of a bug, it's a feature. Like the EPA sort of wants that uncertainty so that it's really hard to build a new power plant. Um, you know, if you're trying to build a gas fire power plant, if you're trying to build anything that's, you know, that the EPA deems green, um, you know, green light on all things green, but we do need gas fired power plants to keep the grid up. So uh, it's one of those things where I'm not sure that they know how much damage they're inflicting just by issuing a proposed rule. And it's not supposed to be that way. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a final rule that is the, uh, that's supposed to establish the, the compliance date. Um, so that's one example of sort of how they've colored outside the lines and, and gotten away with stuff that I don't think they should have gotten away with. Uh, I think as soon as the final rule comes out, it's going to get a court stay because it's going to be easy to make the case that EPA is doing what they were just told not to do. Just last year, well, I, I can't say last year, it's 2024. In 2022, they were told, you can't do this. And in 2023, they said, we're doing it again. So um, who, who knows where it's going to go, but it's, it's created so much uncertainty that it's the uncertainty itself that I think EPA sort of has fun with. And that there was a, an, a really telling quote from Gina McCarthy, who is the EPA administrator under Obama, basically, th this was talking about the mercury and air toxic standards. So it's a different rule, but the same idea of like, if you own a power plant, how do you know how to comply with the rules? And her statement, this was on a, uh, this is on the Bill Maher show, actually. Um, her statement was something like, well, even if we lose in court, and she, of course, said she didn't think she would, as is 
the, the, the Matt's rule, and I think she was nodding at the clean power plan too. It's like, even if we lose in court, everybody's already complied. So it's basically had the effect that we wanted, uh, e even if it's found uh, unlawful. I think that's the same approach they're taking here. That is very concerning. So it sounds like on the one hand, there's a picking of winners and losers, which they don't have the best track record on everything from historical environmentalist opposition to nuclear power to support for companies like uh, you know Solyndra through the government. And on the other hand, there's also this regulatory regime that strangles new production of energy potentially. Could you elaborate on all of that? Yeah, so I think the bind that we're in right now is really tricky. Um, we actually are seeing new electricity demand. We're seeing demand growth on the power sector that we haven't seen in a very long time. So uh, the, those of us who are like grid nerds and follow this are like, well, it plateaued around you know the mid 2000s and really hasn't come back. Um, the game changer here could be the data center and new uses for data all the time. Um, trouble is if you wanted to go gangbusters on like AI or any other thing you're, you're using big data for, um, the power sector is gonna hold you back. Um, those are very electricity intensive processes. So the question is, even if we wanted to go that route and sort of do a high energy digital world, um, do, can the grid support that? And, you know, for most of my career, I would say, yeah, we, we can sort it out. Combination of the, of the EPA rules and everything else going on, I'm not, I'm not sure anymore. Um, even if you can build the power plant, and I realize I'm going to depress everybody, but even if you can build the gas-fired power plant, you still need to be able to frack for the gas, which really hasn't been impacted yet. Um, so we need to protect sort of the hydraulic fracturing process itself. But we also need to build pipelines. That's going to be very tough to do. Um, that really is, when it comes to interstate pipelines, it's a, it's a FERC issue. I hope they continue to approve pipelines. I don't think that's a slam dunk. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried about that too. It's like, well, even if you wanted to power the existing plants, you've already got a plant. If you can't get gas to it, it's it's not helpful. So um, all sorts of layers to this, but the idea that we can be a high energy, you know, sort of a, a you know, th this new era of electricity growth, can we can we even do it? That's that's a huge question. Everybody's asking it now. Everybody has different answers. There's folks who want to build, you know, a lot of transmission lines and do it with renewables and th things like that. Uh, I think that's a very expensive way to do it, but technologically, in an engineering sense, is doable. Um, but yeah, it's it's an open question. Can can we even meet the demand with, with all the constraints on supply? I I I'm skeptical. And that relates to this mindset that is catching on, whereby some people believe that the only way to protect the earth is is degrowth, right? A less economic activity, in some cases, fewer people even, they want a smaller population. And I know that you've uh, commented on this mindset before. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I, I have a physical reaction. I think I winced when, when you said degrowth. I just, uh, there's so much about it that's wrong. I mean, um, first of all, on a global scale, if we don't have growth, like billions of people don't have access to the same amount of energy that our appliances do. I mean, something like a billion people don't have enough electricity to even like power a US fridge. These are uh, really depressing stats, but so there's the, there's the global angle on it. But already, even if you're in an already high energy society, I think we're gonna need even more. I mean, the, 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 the data issue is, is a great example. Um, so I really don't, uh, I mean, at the same time that I, I I want to engage with everyone, I don't have a whole lot to say to the degrowthers. I mean, uh, as long as it's a voluntary choice on their part, I would say degrowth yourself and that's fine. Do what you want with your own family. Um, let's not make it public policy though, which is the tricky part because I think a lot of it does factor into to, to public policy. It bleeds over to this like, well, a great example is all the energy efficiency regs. Like, well, if less is always more, then zero should be ideal, right? Um, if we're possible to go energy negative, we should do that too. Um, I just don't buy into that at all. And I, I can't see eye to eye with those people. Um, 
especially on the population growth side. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with the fact that Paul Ehrlich still gets traction. Um, yeah, he was the author of the the population bomb. What was that? 1968. I'm going to get the year wrong. Um, but he's in his 90s and people are still he still showed up on 60 Minutes. And it's it's a crazy thing. It, I, I have to give it a little. So the, the steel man version is there is something about the running out of resources idea that captivates people. And I don't know why that is, um, but I personally felt a, a huge sense of relief when I fully understood the Julian Simon approach to the world, which is basically we're never going to run out of resources. Um, in fact, a resource is some combination of the physical world with ideas, with technology, with new ways of doing things. Um, so we actually never run out because the only thing that's holding us back is our, you know, our own growth, our, our own imagination, our own technology. So like the, the, the shale boom is a great example. Like if you, if you told me that rocks that are over a mile deep would be powering the world right now, um, if you'd said that 20 years ago, it would sound kind of crazy. Like we knew, I think we knew that there were hydrocarbons trapped in shale rock. Um, it was just a question of, can we ever get it? And it's not a resource if you can't get it, but we figured out in amazing ways how to get it. And we've gotten so much of it. We've, we've got so much now that our former, uh, we used to have gas terminals that were built for export. Uh, sorry, I got that backwards. We used to have gas terminals that were built for import. Now they're built for export. Um, and that's a huge shift. It's a huge shift in mindset. But I, I, I think it it really exemplifies the the Julian Simon view of the world, which is, you know, if you if you think resources are actually finite, then that gets you in that posture of like, well, maybe we should degrowth, we should throttle everything down, fewer people, all that stuff. If you realize that resources have no natural cap at all, because it's some combination of, you know, applying our minds to the, you know, the 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 planet, uh, that is just a completely different. You know, all the stuff like climate anxiety and doomerism and all that stuff. I think I think all of that would fade away if people fully understood the Julian Simon view of the world. And I think it becomes even clearer when you look at how we've overcome past environmental problems as a species. Like at one point, there was a, an absolute crisis of there being too much horse manure in cities. And people didn't know how to deal with that. And then people switched to cars. Oil had been a waste product, right? People didn't even see that as valuable. Um, and now that problem has completely gone away. We have new problems, uh, but there are ways we can potentially overcome those, right? With human ingenuity. To what extent should we be worried about regulations restricting potential new technologies that could help to protect the environment and solve other problems? I think there are almost too many hurdles to to talk about them all. One great example is, so we have a nuclear regulatory commission um, and it does regulate existing nuke plants. And that's, you know, that's basically, so some would say that's all it does because there really hasn't been a new nuclear plant in the U.S. aside from the expansion of Plant Vogel in Georgia, which was, I don't want to say just two units because they're large, but that's in the whole existence of the NRC. So we're talking multiple decades mm -hmm. and they really haven't been able to approve a new plant. Um, and even in the case of, you know, all the stars aligned in Georgia, you sort of had this vertically integrated utility. You had a, a you know, a state that was behind it and all of that. Um, it actually also got a loan guarantee from LPO, uh, side note, but we just, we need to be better at doing new stuff. Um, it's really going to put the industry to the test when we come up with brand new things. There's the small modular reactor. There's again, talks of fusion. I, uh, I try not to roll my eyes when folks talk about fusion because I'm like, we've, I've been hearing about fusion since I was a child and it's always just around the corner and it's still just around the corner. And I'm excited that it could actually happen, but at the same time, I can't imagine, uh, a regulatory commission that is going to say, yes, absolutely, let's do fusion, or yes, let's put SMRs on every factory, which is kind of on the order of what we would need, um, you know, in terms of new technology. But 
yeah, the barriers are everywhere. So uh, s some ideas, if I could uh, frame it positively, some ideas are like, well, we can just sort of leave the existing NRC to regulate the safety of existing plants, but let's come up with a new paradigm for all, all the new stuff. Um, I'm actually on board with that in principle. So, uh, I mean, we'll see where it goes, but that's, that's the big question is even if we come up with the best ideas in the world, is there going to be some bureaucrat saying no? Or funneling resources toward the solutions like green hydrogen, which, you know, might be the next big thing. I don't know, but what if it's not, what if that is a, a huge waste and actually those resources and research could be going toward a better technology? Yeah. And it's going to be tough to, uh, you know, as long as the subsidies are on the table, uh, it's going to be hard to turn away, even if people know that it's not a good technology. Here's here's an example. I'm going to probably upset some people. Um, I would say that the majority of the ethanol that we produce by, you know, using corn is basically a, a pure subsidy play. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, an amount of ethanol that the market would bear that we would, of course, demand. I mean, mm -hmm. it raises the octane of gasoline, for example. It's got It's got a market niche. Most of the people that you talk about, like, why are you growing corn? It's like, oh, I can turn it into ethanol and I can make a lot of money. Like, oh, how are you making the money? Subsidies. And it's just gotten, it becomes its own business. Um, so I, I do worry about things like that, where you don't really get, you're not sending the market signal to stop doing what you're doing. Um, if there's a subsidy for green hydrogen, we're going to get green hydrogen, whether it makes sense or not. Um, so I, I, I see that all the time. And I, I, I am concerned about that. Another policy that we've been hearing a lot about recently would be carbon taxation. There were recently those proposals for um, a carbon tariff or a carbon tax on imports that you responded to. Uh, I know some people who uh, support the idea of a carbon tax because they say it uses market mechanisms, but there have also been a lot of criticisms of it. What's your take on carbon taxation? So it's one of those fun theories to talk about. Um, and if you if you squint really hard, you can see how it might work. Um, there is sort of the Pigubian approach to internalizing externalities. And I'm on board with the textbook approach. I kind of like it. Um, the trouble is actually getting to any of the things that you could, in the textbook context, you can just assume, assume a can opener. It's just, it, it just exists. So one of the things that you would need to assume for a carbon tax to really work is, and by work, I mean, just internalize the externality. I don't mean actually get the climate outcome that you need because let's be honest, the U.S. is a drop in the bucket and the global CO2, all of that. Um, but just to sort of make the idea of a carbon tax work, you would need to know the marginal social cost of carbon. And that, once you sort of take a magnifying glass to that concept, it looks really bad up close, really, really bad. Um, the value of it hinges more on the discount rate that you choose than anything else. So uh, if you want to follow the rules and do sort of a cost-benefit analysis approach, using 3%, the cost is, is kind of high. Using 7%, my gosh, it falls to almost nothing. Um, so... Which discount rate do you use? And that's it, I. Every time the the concept of a carbon tax comes up, I highlight these issues, and then you know what tends to come back is, well, shouldn't we do it anyways? Like, um, I think unless you can really sort out every problem with the policy, I don't I don't see the benefit in going forward with it. What I hear from a lot of folks too is wouldn't you trade all of the subsidies and mandates and regulations and all of that stuff? Wouldn't you trade all of that stuff for a carbon tax? And uh, I, my answer is it depends. Uh, I actually don't think that you can do all the trading. And in fact, it's not clear that even if you had a federal carbon tax, it's not clear that you could preempt all the different state policies that are going on. Um, so that sort of uh, grand bargain is talked about a lot, but I don't think it's possible. Right. It also seems like if it were implemented in reality, it wouldn't be in place of all the existing regulations. It would almost certainly be in addition to them just politically. Isn't that correct? Yep. That's exactly how it would work out. I mean, so the idea that, for example, you know, the the DOE efficiency regs that we're talking about, the EPA power plant rule, um, I'm not sure that that stuff would go away. In fact, 
uh, if you're expecting an act of Congress to stop that stuff, I mean, they never were operating under an act of Congress to begin with uh, in the EPA case with, with power plants for sure. Um, so I'm not sure that you could undo all that stuff. And in fact, if you wanted to do both, I think it, there'd be very little um, that Congress could do to stop EPA under under the current par paradigm to actually to do both. Um, another great example is uh, some folks point to Canada and they're like, "Doesn't isn't Canada doing it right? They have a carbon tax and dividend program. And so for a bunch of people, it just looks like a check that comes from the government. And that's sort of a thing that pe people have gravitated towards. Like, well, that's nice. Um, even that, which a lot of people point to as sort of the the example of what to do. Uh, do you recall a couple months ago, Trudeau, this was going into this winter, he proposed that uh, the East Coast provinces would not be subject to a carbon tax on their heating oil. Um, he actually, he he said that it would be a waiver of the, the carbon tax for heating oil in general. Only the Eastern provinces use heating oil. So you can always find a way to basically benefit the people you like politically. You basically do a broad-based tax and then give waivers. Um, so I would expect that in the U.S. too, even if we had, which is sort of the economic argument for it. It's like, well, it needs to be broad-based. Everybody needs to be, you know, rowing together. I think even if it starts that way, th the politics of 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 waivers and trying to favor the 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 folks who voted for you, that's always going to be there. So uh, even in the Canada example, even in sort of the best real world example we can find, uh, it didn't take them long to to fall into the politics of like, well, I'm going to give waivers for my friends. Um, that's exactly where it went. And uh, it's been repealed in Australia, correct? I know some places have dropped carbon taxation. And there's the question also of the costs of any policy, not just the possible benefits. With a carbon tax, doesn't it really raise the price of practically everything yeah and if you wanted to you know if you wanted to tax co2 at the you know what they've actually done so what the biden team has done is they've updated of course that there's always an update they've updated the estimates of the social cost of carbon in the obama era it was like 51 dollars a ton the trump era they used a different set of assumptions and it was more like seven dollars a ton um what the EPA is trying to do under Biden now is uh, they propose $190 a ton. So this is almost like, you know, a, a quadrupling of the Obama era price of carbon. So um, there's always stuff like that. where like, well, if it can be anything you want it to be, and the amount of the tax really does hit people, you know, in terms of like this would hit the price of gasoline, price of electricity, price of all the stuff. And then that's also baked into all the transportation costs, which then show up in literally everything. Um, you know, that, that that gets baked into the shipping cost of all your food, all, everything. Um, so yeah, it's it's basically a, a tax on everything at an amount decided by a bureaucrat that you can't argue with. And there's no limiting principle then it can just... There, there really is not. And the, the, the other thing that's crazy about it, and this is once you once you dig into the weeds, you can see how absurd this is. So a lot of the models look at damages from an increase in CO2 concentrations to the year 2300. Um, I'm not sure we know what the year 2300 is going to look like, and I'm not sure we should be worried about costs that might be hitting people in the year 2300. They're probably going to be far wealthier than we are, and they're going to have problems that we couldn't anticipate. Um, if you'd sort of do the back cast, it would be like talking to somebody in, I don't know, the year 1746 and saying, well, shouldn't you be paying a carbon tax because it's going to hit us in the year, you know, 2024? Um, it's just the intergenerational assumptions and all that stuff. It's really kind of once you scrutinize it, it looks a lot like nonsense. Um, it's not going to, you won't make a lot of friends saying that the social cost of carbon is BS. But once you dig into all, all the assumptions that sort of make it what it is, it uh, it falls apart pretty quickly. So we've been talking about a lot of fairly depressing things, different obstacles and threats to progress on the energy and environmental fronts. But we like to typically end this podcast on an optimistic note. What are you most optimistic about when it comes to 
energy and environmental policy? So I think there there is a flip side to this idea that there's a very low willingness to pay to address climate change. I think the flip side is the existing policies that we have now, the, the, the policies that have only grown in the past few years, I think people will get sick of them. Um, I think especially this idea that you, know, you, you get into sort of the United Nations framework and global agreements and stuff like that. Um, the idea that we would stick to something like that, knowing what it's going to cost. And th this whole net zero push is a great example. Like, it's so easy to just say, yeah, I'm pro net zero. It's really difficult to say, I'm going to drastically change my life, increase the cost of everything, and in fact, get used to the idea that I don't have electricity. Um, for, for this cause, that's easy to say, it's hard to hard to execute. I think I'm optimistic that when people realize what it takes, they're going to say, actually, this thing, this uh, climate burden, climate anxiety, net zero goals, all of this stuff I've been carrying around is just a bag of bricks, and I can drop it. I can choose to drop it, and it's not actually going to have any effect globally at all, and I can just go and live the way I want to live. I'm excited that people are going to start realizing that, um, and I hope they do, because um, the, the way that it works is it's always like, well, of course, everybody wants to address climate change. And the common question is like, is it real? Do you believe in it? Um, it's kind of an absurd framework. Like, well, yeah, we're emitting more CO2 than we ever have. And that might not even be a bad thing. And it depends on a ton of assumptions. And uh, But that whole approach of like worrying so much about that um, I see people basically, and the, the polling shows it. So the 2021 poll that said 57% of people are happy to pay a dollar a month. It's fell to 38%. Um, the fact that that number is falling is very interesting to me. And it tells me that maybe people are catching on. Uh, so so I am optimistic about that. It's that uh, there's so much worry going on right now that's unnecessary. We can just drop it. I'm hopeful there as well. It seems like this false choice that's being presented, this idea that you have to have more human suffering in order to protect the environment, that doesn't make any sense. Again, if you look at the history of how our species has overcome environmental solutions, um, environmental problems in the past. Well, anyway, yeah, and it, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a quasi religious thing. And I think the answer is always more reason, more rationality. And I think the, the more a, of a skeptical, rational light that people shine on this, um, we can sort of emerge from the dark ages, you know? That is the perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for talking with me, Travis. This has been, uh, this has given, I think, everyone a lot to think about. It's great to join you. Thank you. <laughs>